morning and welcome to our service of morning prayer which is led for us today by the Reverend Bruce Anderson. Our first Sunday back in the church last week went very well. Um, it was a little strange with us all sitting so far apart. We had 39 people over the two services and as far as we could tell the protective measures that we put in place seem to work very well. Please do remember that if you would like to come to a service in the church any Sunday, it is important that you let me know well in advance so that we can plan for the right number of people. But don't worry because these recorded services will continue to be provided for the time being because of course we're aware that some people still don't yet feel quite able to come back to worship in the building. But as we know, our God is with us wherever we are, whether we're in church, at home, or indeed anywhere else. And so I thought these words from a hymn by Noel Richards seemed very appropriate to use as our opening prayer. So let us pray. To be in your presence, to sit at your feet, where your love surrounds us, and makes us complete. This is our desire, O Lord. This is our desire. Amen. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our Digswell Village Church morning worship. Thank you to Diana for her welcome and opening prayer. During the service this morning, Whenever you see words up here on the screen in yellow text, I invite you to join in by saying those words. We begin our service this morning with our call to worship. In sacred times of word, wonder and awe, in ordinary days of work and play, in every moment, God is with us. Whether we are stuck in doubt's mud, or standing on faith's shoreline, in every place, God is with us. In those who teach us, and those who trouble us, in those who surprise us, and those who forgive us, in every person, God is with us. A little later in our first Bible reading, we will hear the words of the psalmist as he writes about the awesome power of God about the mighty things God has done. The themes of the psalmist are picked up by the author of our first hymn, I Sing the Almighty Power of God.
In our prayers of confession, we not only think of ourselves, but of the evil that afflicts the whole world. In a sense, we are representatives of that world. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you as a typical sample of humanity to confess our common complicity in evil and to ask for your pardon and assistance. Our motives are sometimes suspect. Our achievements are limited. Our virtues are tainted. Our love is patchy and our faith is hardly as big as a mustard seed. We do not always clearly see the Christian path through this complex era. And when we do, we do not follow the light that has been given. We do succeed at times and we are grateful, but also we stumble a lot and fall and fail more than we like others to know about. When we have sinned, we admit feeling more sorry for ourselves than ashamed and more self-pitying than repentant. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Only you can fix us, healing God. If, like a physiotherapist, you have to be cruel to be kind, let it be so. If, like a nurse, you need to tend our wounds and urge us to be patient, let it be so. If, like a dietitian, you must place limits on what we feed our mind and spirit, then so restrict us. If, like a mother, you need to give us your kiss of absolution and send us on our way with new peace and energy, then grant us your motherly love, we humbly pray. Through Christ Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Sisters and brothers, we are numbered among those fortunate people who know they have a Saviour. Ours is not to wear failures like a wet blanket, but to accept the saving love of Christ and to step out again into the newness of all things. We are to live as the forgiven children of that holy parent whose love is without limit. Thanks be to God. Amen. We hear our two scripture readings now. First we hear from Psalm 114 and then from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. The first reading is Psalm 114, God's wonders at the Exodus. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back. O mountains, that you skip like rams. O hills, that you skip like lambs. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. This is the word of the Lord. This reading is taken from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle the accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and, as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So this slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him 
and forgave him the debt. But the same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused, then he went and threw him into prison, until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you have not had mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to, to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Peter says to Jesus, 
Lord, how many times shall my brother or sister sin against me and yet still receive my forgiveness? Is seven times enough? And Jesus answered, I'm not asking you to forgive seven times. Seventy times seven is more like it. From any angle, Peter's suggestion that we might be asked to forgive someone up to seven times seems reasonable, probably more than reasonable. Millions of our sisters and brothers can't find it in their hearts to forgive even once. And among the people of the church, twice or three times often stretches the limits of both patience and mercy. So what about 70 times then? I think it would be a pretty remarkable person who could, from the depths of their heart, truly forgive another person that many times. But Jesus' response, 70 times 7, 490 times? Surely such mercy would truly seem to be well-nigh impossible. Such a challenge would probably even try a saint. In his response to Peter's question, Jesus is, of course, using hyperbole. He isn't being literal. He's using exaggeration to make a point. He's saying, stop calculating the size of grace. The life of love and mercy doesn't keep score. With Jesus, we've moved from the realm of legal condemnation and legal self-justification to the commonwealth of love. God doesn't deal with us according to our deserving. God doesn't keep score of our sins and decide at what point we should be struck off his list like some divine Santa Claus deciding whether we've been naughty or nice. Jesus is the herald of God's new kingdom, a commonwealth of abounding love where forgiveness and healing are freely offered. Forgive 70 times 7. Live in the new realm of God as ushered in by Jesus Christ. Stop legalism. Cease tallying up either errors or virtues. Live by love, mercy and peace. And above all else, live with that same tender yet extravagant love that Jesus had for those around him. Stop counting. Start a new way of life. But forgiveness isn't cheap. If it could be bought on the open market, true forgiveness would be extremely expensive, beyond the budget of even multi-multi-billionaires. I'd put it to you like this. If the forgiveness we presume to offer others comes cheap, if it isn't grounded in the costly love of Jesus, then it's sentimental fake. If it's patronising or glib, easygoing or careless, then it's not the true article. True mercy, in many circumstances, has to be as hard as nails. We never help a person by, our demand, by not demanding accountability for their actions. Before love can bring its healing work, confrontation may be necessary. Glossing over the bad stuff is not forgiveness. A truly forgiving person must be able to say no in certain situations. Carefree indulgence is not the answer. Take instances of drug addiction or domestic violence, for example. The addict exploits the family shamelessly, borrowing money and then eventually stealing things. In such circumstances, repetitious sentiment sentimental forgiveness is not showing love. Love must have some strength to it. It must have titanium in it. Saying no and confronting the addict 
is an act of mercy. The same applies in cases of domestic violence. The, the abuser plays all repentant and begs for forgiveness. Too often, forgiveness is granted without any new rules being laid down. It would be more loving to say the very first time, I forgive you, but if this ever happens again, I'm out of here. There are no more chances. And then act on it. That is true loving. Jesus' forgiveness was never sloppily indulgent. He loved people enough to confront them. Forgiveness must always stem from the strength of true love, not from syrupy, sentimental, indulgent kindness. Many people speak of giving unconditional love, and if we can indeed give unconditional love, then total forgiveness is possible. Unfortunately, however, for most of us, such a perfect love is beyond us. A few saints may get close to it, but the bulk of us know God is able to sow love and will do forever, but not so for flawed creatures like us. Realistically, most of us aren't capable of giving unconditional love, even to our loved ones, let alone to other people. It's an ideal which, may, which we may aim for. The wonder world of 70 times 7 entices us. We need to aim for it and practice it whenever we have the opportunity. We must give it our best shot and pray for God's Spirit to indwell us, per permeating all of our thoughts and feelings. Even then, we'll often find ourselves not fulfilling the goal. The realm of 70 times 7, the kingdom of God in Christ, has arrived. It is upon us, within us, and around us. The commonwealth of love has been inaugurated and established on earth. But we citizens in this realm are still learners in the school of Christ. Never ignore the prayer taught by Christ. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Don't be dismayed when you find it difficult to forgive. Don't lose heart. God's work will not be in vain. Through life into death and in life beyond death, 70 times 7 is being practised in you, for you and through you. You will reach that goal where you will forgive as perfectly as you have been forgiven. Then the moment will have arrived when joy and peace, wonder and praise will know no bounds. Amen. We're going to join together now in our prayers of intercession. And during this prayer, there is a bidding and a response. And you'll see those on the screen up here during the prayer. And at the end of the prayer, we'll say together the Lord's Prayer, including those words, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So to the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, could you please respond, hear our prayer. Praying for others is not an easy out for us from our responsibilities. It is a pledge of our intentions. And so we join together to pray for others. Let us pray. Dear God, how do you keep track of us all? So many people, so many needs, so much suffering, 
Yet you love each of us like the most generous of fathers and feel our pain like the most devoted of mothers. Help us to be inclusive in our loving like you are. We pray for those who are unwell at this time, praying especially for those who are becoming infected by the coronavirus and those unfortunate enough to need hospital or intensive care because of COVID-19. We pray for those people from our own congregation and those people we know who may be unwell. We pray for Margaret Staple as she continues to recover from her stroke and for Christine Pryor as she recovers from her surgery. We pray for Joyce Williams as she receives assessment and treatment in hospital. We ask that you would be with them and others known to us, comforting and strengthening them. And from our book of remembrance, we remember those who will be recalling the anniversary of the death of a loved one during this coming week. Today, we pray for the families of Lily Elms and Paul Bolton. We also pray for Chris and John Morgan, whose father David Morgan had his funeral this week. Be with them and bring them comfort through their, through their thoughts and memories. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the abused and those who seek justice for them. We pray for the weak and those who lend them their unmeasured support. We pray for the heavy laden and those who share the load. Give all of these encouragement and persistence in spite of any difficulties. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the misunderstood and those who listen. We pray for the timid and those who speak up for them. We pray for the lost and those who work to see their recovery. May all of these find strength and determination in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the strong in faith and those who learn from them. We pray for the strugglers and those who affirm them. We pray for the happy and those who rejoice with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compared with you, holy friend, our compassion is miserly and our circle of care is most meagre. Nevertheless, we want to be more like you, asking that you will conscript our prayers and actions into the work of your universal salvation. Through Christ Jesus, our Saviour. And we pray together now the words Jesus taught to his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. At about this point in our service, we'd ordinarily take up the offering. However, because of the coronavirus guidelines, we're not doing that at the moment and it's likely to be some time before we can. Many of us are now giving in other ways, 
via telephone or internet banking, for example, and this is very helpful. Our income, though, for the foreseeable future, looks as though it'll be reduced quite a bit because we're not getting any income from the use of the building by other groups as they've been unable to use them. It would seem then that this might be an opportune time for us to think about our own giving and see whether we could increase it to help the church manage this situation. So I, I wonder if you could just please take some time to think about this during the coming week. And if you can, make arrangements to change your standing orders and so on. It would be very helpful for the church at this time. Well, let's just take a moment to pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that you are with us each moment of the day, each day of our lives. And we thank you for all that you give to us. We know that everything we have comes from you. And we ask that you would be with each one of us as we think about our offerings to the church. Help us to be generous in our offerings and help us to be able to, together, help the church through this tricky time when our income is reduced because of the coronavirus. Gracious God, we thank you for, this, for the blessings you give us. In the name of your Son we pray. Amen. Well, as we draw near to the end of our service today, we join together to sing our final hymn. It's the popular Sydney Carter hymn that describes our life and our relationship with God as a journey. Each step we take on that journey, God is with us, guiding and supporting us. Let's sing then, One More Step Along the World I Go. service with the blessing and the grace. In every person, God is with us. Let us welcome God in the family we know all too well and in the strangers we will meet in the coming days. In every choice, Jesus is with us. 
let us welcome the Christ who serves us unexpectedly and in those who will offer us forgiveness. In every moment, the Spirit is with us. Let us welcome the Spirit who calls us to live as well as calling us to give of ourselves without question. And we say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, our service is over. Thank you for joining us in this service today. And I hope that we will see you again. God bless you all and have a safe and enjoyable week.